Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. You know what else really helps? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Come on, man. Anyway, this episode is the fifth of a nine-part series of Uruguayan wine reviews. These are all free samples, so I have a total autonomy in these reviews. Be sure to watch the first episode of this series for a more in-depth feature on Uruguayan wine. The short version is that wine has certainly been made in Uruguay since the early 1600s. However, it's not until 1870 that the modern wine industry really begins in Uruguay. All right, today's wine comes from Antigua Bodega Stegnari. Not to be confused with the Argentine bulk wine producer Antigua Bodega. Make sure you add the Stegnari. Anyway, the winery is in the Canelones department of Uruguay. Being from an Italian immigrant family myself, I know, it's, I know that it's possible to pronounce this, way, at least, pronounce this name at least a couple ways. It could be pronounced Stagnati, which should be the correct Italian pronunciation, or Stagnati, which is probably the proper Spanish pronunciation. I'll go with the second one since that's how most English speakers would pronounce it anyway. If the family sees us, for sure correct me if I've pronounced the name wrong. Anyway, their story starts in 1880 when Vicente Stagnari, or Stignati probably in Italy, began producing wine in the province of Ancona in the commune of Loreto, Italy. We then jumped to 1928 when the winery was founded in the Santos Lugares region of the Canelones department. Then we skip to the current generation with Hector Nelson Stagnari and his daughter, the sixth generation, keeping the family business going. They have 38 hectares of vineyards divided between two locations. The first is on the estate in Santos Lugares. The second is in Melilla, Montevideo. The vineyards are planted to Tanat, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Syrah, Merlot, Sangiovese, Chardonnay, and Sauvignon Blanc. All harvesting is done by hand as far as I can tell. The estate vineyard is surrounded by stone quarries. The sandy clay topsoil is about three feet deep with a bedrock of pink granite over 600 million years old. According to the website, this is the only place this pink granite exists. And that's really it. So let's get into the stats of the wine. The 2018 Antigua Bodega Stagnari Prima Donna Tanat. Suggested retail price is $23. From Canelones is 100% Tanat, hand harvested, Hand selection of bunches. Pre-fermentation maceration is three days, meant to express the best fruit potential. That's how the website puts it. Maceration is 15 days, aged eight months in French oak. No mention of how much is used, new or whatever. It is not cold stabilized. They made a point of saying this. The ABV is 13.5%. Let's talk about the lack of cold stabilization. Red wines in general don't go through this, because of that, it's possible you may get tartrate crystals, aka wine diamonds, that will collect on the cork if the wine has been laying down and get some crunchies in the wine. Perfectly safe. Most wines go through this since the tartrate crystals are easier to see in a white wine and people kind of freak out about it as far as cold stabilization. All right, let's get into the wine. Like I said, red wines don't necessarily go through cold stabilization just because, well, you know, the bottles are usually not clear like white wine bottles are. And when people see these little wine diamonds or these crystals, they sometimes freak out and think it's glass. You know, so they think that something happened in the bottling. So it's one of the reasons that we do, we do cold stabilization. Plus it's just an unpleasantness of getting that grittiness uh, in a wine. Now, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago for sure, there really was no such thing as cold stabilization, at least not in the sense of how we do it. Um, so if you had a bit of tartrate crystals or other things in your wine, it wasn't, it wasn't that big of a deal. They're like, yeah, it's part of the wine. All right. So we have a really a deep concentration of ruby. Like there's not that much see-through at all. So the last week's wine, 
the Zinfandel, Zinfandel is a thin skin grape. So you had a thin skin grape or a thinner skin grape with a very thick skin grape. And now 55% of the wine was Tanat, and then the other 45% was a combination of Merlot and Zinfandel. With, I think it was like 15% Zinfandel. So it wasn't a lot, but it was vinified in such a way, it wasn't like, like opaque. This one is more in that opaque category, uh, being really 100% Tanat. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, a couple couple weeks ago or a couple episodes ago, I talked about the seal. This wine had it. It's just that the seal isn't on the neck, but this one has it on the back, the VCP, a uh, little seal there. There's a savoriness already jumping out of the glass. It's not highly aromatic, but it's, that was the first thing that popped in my mind. Yeah, there's like this kind of smokiness to it. Um, so I was watching, so if you've ever searched YouTube for wine people besides me. I'm like, why would you? No, anyway, you really should because there's some people out there doing some incredible work. I still say I have the best wine show anywhere. But with that said, uh, uh, Dr. Ma Matthew Hockey, um, he's got some really great content on his stuff. He started off as exotic wine travel and I, I ran into him when I ran into but I, I discovered him with doing wines from uh, Hungary, if I remember correctly. He was like big into Hungarian wines and that was kind of his thing and the pandemic was going on. And now he's really branched out into other stuff. Now, I haven't looked at some early, early stuff, but he's he's really great. He does travel a lot. Um, anyway, he was doing a bunch of Zinfandels or the, the, the grape of Zinfandel and its parent uh, from Croatia. And he kept talking about Garij. Um, and I keep forgetting that just like uh, furniture polish, Garij is one of those things I just never really remember to say, but this has that. Um, it's kind of like a collection of, of herbs and spices or herbs more than anything else. There's a rusticity to things. So it's got that. It's got a touch of a little, little smokiness to it, almost a little smoke bomb. And it's got a savory meat quality to it, like, like smoked meat. Kind of like really like, also like a salami type of thing, right? Almost sanguine. And it's really all those aromas I'm getting rather than really any fruit aromas. Like if I was smelling this wine, I would totally think this is an old world wine because it concentrates on the non-fruit stuff, at least on the aroma. And yeah, I'm gonna say there's no new oak on this. I mean, there's oak, but I'm gonna say this is second, at least second use oak. Okay, let's just get into the wine here. It kind of carries through that the fruit isn't the dominant thing, but now I get the fruit. So it's really rich, I would say ripe fruit. We get that blackberry, we get raspberry, but more black fruit than anything else. So a blackberry, black raspberry, um, plum, plum is considered a black fruit, though sometimes you call it purple. Um, so a black plum type of thing. Um, yeah, it's like lots of dark fruit to it. It's rich um, as far as the, the ripeness of the fruit. But then you have, it's combined like, it's like, it's like taking, here we go. It's like, get a cracker, put some like just some cheese, we'll say manchego cheese, you know, something with a little bit of savoriness to it, right? And then you have, uh, we well, start off with like, like a little thing of salami, maybe chorizo, okay? Um, or pepperoni or something like that. And then you put like a little manchego cheese on there, a little hard cheese, right? A little bit of savoriness to it. And then you slap on some like black raspberry jam or plum jam on top of it, right? There you go. That's what it's like. Man, I haven't had a wine where I could just do that real quick. Well, I mean, I had some of the wines from today. I had like other like memories and other things. Like it made me think of certain types of food. So yeah, I guess I had some other wines like that today. But this one just really struck me with, with that just specific type of combination. I mean, just because there's a smokiness to it, this is a perfect brisket wine. This is a perfect wine. You're at the barbecue. You are literally standing next to that grill, next to that fire, and you're smelling the smoke, and you're just having a grand old time drinking this wine and, and just grabbing that brisket right off the grill, eating it right from the grill, Forget what, it, you know, you don't have to put any extra barbecue sauce on it. Whatever was basted with, that's what this is. This is, oh my goodness. So in many ways, this kind of acts like Zinfandel for me, except the tannin is higher. This one didn't like smack me in the face with the tannin. Um, again, last last week's wine was the first red wine I'd had all day. So the tannin hit hard, but it is absolutely noticeable. Like I would be like, 
oh, this isn't Zinfandel, but it kind of acts the fruitiness of the Zinfandel, but then all that smokiness, oh man, this is really good. With that said, it might be slightly corked. I don't know. Like, I'm getting this aroma. I think it's just the smokiness. And it's, I haven't had like a truly corked wine in a while. Uh, and I'm usually, I wouldn't say overly sensitive, but I'm usually really good at picking up uh, a wine with TCA. But sometimes I get, I get tricked. Because it didn't come off, like normally TCA comes off pretty quickly. I don't, I don't normally notice it on the nose. Sometimes it does take it to the palate. But I think it's just that smokiness. You know what it is? It's a bit sulfurous. It's got that smoke bomb thing. And that's what I was, that's what I'm picking up on. Totally fine. Um, there's not, this does not to say anything about how much SO2 is in the wine. Some wines just come across as that way. It also could be just, it could be just, that's the, the it's it could be like in a reductive state. I think that's what I'm getting. Yeah, it's not, it's not corked. It's not TCA. It's the sulfurousness to the wine. It's going to blow off um, eventually. But um, yeah, so when we say that, it's, it's the fact that there's a reduction in the wine. So when wine goes through reduction, it, 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 uh, there's a buildup of sulfur, not SO2 per se, um, but a buildup of sulfur in the wine and, it, and you, you smell it. This is not over the top, but it comes across as a little bit of a smoke bomb type of thing. It's still very enjoyable. It's, it was just like a small component. I mean, I think everything else about it, the meatiness, the, the little bit of jamminess to it, that savoriness to it, that smokiness, that good smoke to it is all great there. It's just that there was that one little thing that kept nagging me and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's just a little sulfurous, but that would be something where put this through a, a, an aggressive decanting, just, just put that thing or through a Venturi type of thing and it'll it'll really open up the wine first of all and it will blow off all that all that stuff yeah that's what it is all right cool all right well that's gonna do it for today's show if you uh enjoy what i'm doing here make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time